here we go. Hello again. I'm losing track of all of these video conferencing platforms. Oh, it's insane, isn't it? How many, um, uh, it's like how many different video, yes. Uh, first it started out with how many different um, like Zoom versions um, you could have, whether yeah. I'm probably finding with all of your clients, everybody's got their own different, uh, different tech. And then when you get to the conferences, it's even more so. But very depressing news for the, for the first time in about six months or five months, we're back to Zoom drinks this evening because we're back on high levels of. Um, you're, you're, in, you're in Dublin or? Um, yeah, yeah. So. Oh, my commiserations. I, I moved from Melbourne last year and uh, um, all my friends over there have just uh, come out of effectively six months. Um, yeah. Literally today, um, some one friend reminded me 111 days they've been under like really severe. Yeah. So. I was going into winter and we're all feeling it. Yeah, I heard um, Ireland's pretty tough. Yeah, well, well, we thought it was a good thing at the start because when it first happened, our prime minister is is a doctor. Uh, he's now our deputy prime minister in the rotation. So, so we were delighted at the time, and now we're kind of going, it's, it's a pity he's a doctor because it's very <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Wow, well, I mean, you know, who would want to be a politician at the moment? Uh, oh. Brent, are you down? You're down in a very small box on my screen. Um, have you? Yeah, interesting. Have you clicked, Brent? Are you clicked on um, share uh, video? Buying, sharing, sharing video. He must be because there's some other people who are um, watching us. We've got three minutes. So Brent, can you um can you hear us? Maybe we could a couple before we start. So Here comes Brad. It's Brad no. Hey, Brad, how you doing? Good. Can you hear oh, me? Yeah, it's Paul here. Can you hear me? Yep. It's not, it's, not, it's not too early there, is it? What's that? What time is it there? It is uh, 9.28. Oh, yeah, okay. I thought you were looking very fresh. <laughs> Good morning, Brad. I'm Claire. Good morning. Looking forward. Now, this is strange, Paul, because um, you've gone off video on my Hello. screen. Is that just me or um, Brad? What can you see on your screen? Yeah, I, I have on? I have no video from Paul. I'm turning it on and off. Can you see us? Yes, I can. Hmm. Uh, have you? tried i don't know if you've got other screens open um don't know yeah, why that would make a difference with with brad joining us i've definitely paid my electricity bill so that, <laughs> that's okay i've interestingly i've got superpowers i can um remove you if i want i realized let's oh maybe i have to ah brent sorry i did i had oh, and you're back get you in oh i'm in okay cool um yes <laughs> ah here we go great ah, thanks for seeing fantastic just in time <laughs> just about spot on at 1 30. <laughs> <laughs> so um uh it's always great to have people joining from different countries actually too and, um, like, sorry, this is something i probably should have done before the session but brent meet brad brad meet brent hi. how you doing nice to meet you <laughs> <laughs> you as well um, no, a delight to have you all here. Um, and uh, I might just um, see whether there's some other people in the audience 
joining us um, and remind them of the, the process. So um, this is a, a round table. So what it is not is a workshop or a presentation. So this is a no slides um, session and uh, we're absolutely privileged today um, to be here. Um, thanks to um, Google as uh, one of API Day's London gold sponsors um, and that makes these types of events available to everybody to participate from anywhere in the world, actually, um, which is which is great. And uh, um, Paul, um, uh, you're here representing Google as a head of business strategy and finance. Um, uh, thank you. Joining thank you. us from Dublin. Yes, thank you. It sounds very, it, it sounds very impressive. I <laughs> <laughs> will we'll look forward to hearing um, yeah. uh, in this session uh, um, how you're helping uh, organizations understand and navigate uh, the complexity of this this world of finance. Um, uh, but, uh, absolutely. Thanks a million for this opportunity for the team at API Days. And um, looking forward to the conversation. And uh, it was funny there in the green room just talking about how all of these challenges are human. <laughs> Most of the challenges are human rather than technology because the, the technology does what it's told. Um, so really looking forward to the conversation about the type of business challenges we're facing, the opportunities and challenges. That's great. Thank you, Paul. And uh, we're delighted to have uh, um, uh, Brent uh, McLean joining us from uh, Credit Suisse Universal Bank. Uh, and um, welcome. Oh, thank How's you. How's it with you? Um, going yeah. well. As you can see behind me, a birthday party for, for our oldest boy was uh, going on yesterday and again today. They're outside somewhere making noise with other kids. So I've got some alone time now to uh, to do this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we'll make sure that we uh, finish promptly on time so you can get back to birthday cake and uh, whatever else is going on. <laughs> Thanks. And Brad, you're joining us from the US this morning for you. Um, Brad, yes, good morning. Excited to be here. I... Yep. Oh, Brad's um, uh, in, uh, uh, heads up IT application development in emerging partnerships at National Mutual Assurance Insurance in the States. So, so how's it with you this morning? Yep, yep. Like I said, I'm very excited to be here. I think it's a privilege to talk through. Um, I just echo exactly what Paul was saying that it's, it's always the people, right? right? It's never the and, technology. Um, we'll the make technology this conversation as human as possible for our audience as well. So um, they can join us. Uh, we, we look forward to their questions coming um, stream uh, through the online chat. Um, any one of us can, you know, join. I'll, I'll basically kind of curate the questions as much as possible. But if if you've got any content, any of you that you'd like to share, links or whatever. Um, or uh, articles you've been reading and stuff, if they come up in the conversation, just, just punch them in there. And I hope that the audience uh, will, um, uh, you know, uh, be, be brave, you know, in terms of contributing into the conversation because uh, um, that's, what it, that's what it's all about. You can even um, join us on video and, uh, and or audio if you like, um, but I appreciate that uh, um, it might not be the right time zone, it might not be appropriate for you right now. Um, so please join the chat. So, Paul, I might um, ask you to kick off this. Um, the theme that you've chosen for, for this was uh, inserting a new developer marketing process into an existing marketing mix of an enterprise. Um, maybe you could share some kind of Google observations on, on well, keen you know, on the human theme, but what, what, yeah. what, what humanly is happening in organizations in this space at the moment in your, in your view? Yeah. Well, well, the 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 title also focuses on mature organisations, and I had a we had, we had a very interesting conversation back when we were out travel, and and I was with a couple of colleagues from Google, and we were going into a, a bank, and uh, like an insurance company, very mature, and one of my colleagues said, "Okay, this is what the bank and what are they doing," and I said, "Okay, but the key thing to remember going in here is that Google is only twenty years old." As it was at that stage, uh, and this 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 bank was established in the year that the American War of Independence finished. Okay, so so there are some very mature organizations organizations out there worthy of huge respect, and um, because they have gone through so many economic and social and political changes over a very long time. So, so Brent and Brad have a fascinating challenge working in mature organizations that have been through multiple phases of. Of development, so, so I was going to hope to throw the floor open to them and do more more listening than talking. Um, conscious that I work for a very young organisation, albeit a very big organisation, 
and ask them maybe Brent first, just to kick us off. What are the additional challenges uh, trying to bring in what may be initially perceived as radically new business strategies and, and business model innovations into a mature, hugely respected, but mature organization? Well, I think first and foremost, when you're talking about um, bringing anything new into a mature organization, whether it's a bank or an insurer, um, it's what's in it for us? What's the opportunity to make it a, a, a product? How do you commoditize it? How do you make profit with it? Um, irregardless of, let's say, the technology behind it, right? Once you have that business understanding of the potential and where it can go, it's then a matter of them convincing the internal business areas or, or leaders of different areas of the organization to understand that the technology is kind of driving this, at least with open banking and open finance, is actually driving the capabilities of new product offerings or expanding your product offerings outside of your the walls that have been built around the banking environment or insurance environment you know, for the past few hundred years. That makes sense. Do you have a similar experience, Brad, or, or additional flavors on that? Can you, Can you um, hear, hear something, Brad? Uh, uh, Paul has, has gone okay. away on, on my screen. Brad, I might um, just as a check, are you using Chrome as your browser? Because um, I know sometimes people have some challenges with that. Um, okay. Yeah. Did, did, um, did you get Paul, maybe, um, we, so Brad, we were just, uh, um, the invitation was to share a bit of the story um, from uh, National Mutual's perspective in terms of how you're experiencing some of the change that you're taking from a very mature perspective. Yeah. Of so the nationwide story is a little bit different. Bringing uh, APIs into into a, you know our mature organization, uh, as you might imagine, some uh, an, an enterprise of hmm. so it was it was technology bringing in uh, having to try to influence the business. Um, much like Brent was saying, hey, you have to understand how are, how are we going to monetize this? How are we going to productize this? How are we going to leverage this uh, to drive our business forward? And quite frankly, that was the hardest part is to, is to make sure match the benefits that you get from the technology. And so over the course of the last four years, I would say that uh, while there's been a huge focus on things like operationalizing uh, and making sure that it's like a well-oiled machine behind the scenes. Uh, the hardest thing was getting the business to get their mindset on, oh, I understand how I, that it's not just a new technology. This is a new way that the world works and we can, you know, meet, in our case, we're a mutual, right? So we can meet members where they are rather than forcing people to come to us and really provide more value. And I think once that clicked, uh, we really saw, um, an acceleration of adoption and understanding of, oh man, we we need to play catch up. That makes sense? Enormously. I think uh, very, very, um, very relevant. Am I, am I still out of the picture? Or can you see me now, Brad? Uh, we can we can see and hear you fine, Paul. Okay. Um, we just had Brad, um, Brad's video is lagging a little bit behind his, his uh, okay. Um, his sound, his audio, but we could hear him okay. okay. Are you coming in and out? Yeah, no, I'm fine. Can I ask uh, you a question, Brent, in terms of the adoption internally? Uh, I suppose, and not just Credit Suisse, in, in, in any large mature organization, what's your professional view about adoption? How much of it can be organic, where key decision makers who are running... All key... you two just hear you just fine. Okay, perfect. Um, how much adoption internally can be organic, you know, from a, I suppose from a bottom up perspective in terms of, of operational team leaders, or how much does there need to be signaling from the top down that this is the way of the future, as, as Brad described it, and that really, you know, transformation is a combination of both doing the new ways and stopping the old ways. 
so so how much of that do you think is necessary to really drive adoption at a reasonable pace well <clears throat> I, th I think it's kind of twofold a bottom-up approach is probably more of the consideration of you know building and utilizing internal apis and, and how that then um, can provide a benefit to especially for a mature organization um, having a bit of legacy technology how you can kind of break that down or have ease of use of data being available and using apis and microservices um, to then expand it into other parts of your organization, whether you're talking about a client-facing tool or UI, or whether you're talking about a relationship manager or internal tools, um, to then have that data available and, and usable. Um, and then outside of that, um, it's then also then taking note of what you can do with that externally. So at least within Credit Suisse, we have a lot of APIs that have been built internally, um, and there is the advantage of trying to have an API first approach. Um, but then if you look at top down, top down is also then about understanding the API governance. You know, we have different divisions in different locations around the world. And how do we then structure the, the API governance in a way that one division is not running off on its own and that we're aligning across the different divisions and from a global perspective. And that kind of has to ha come top down. And for the most part, it has been driven by our um, CTO area, but with me being on the business side, I'm also helping promote that um, internally from a top-down approach on the business side. So that way, there's not a number of different ideas about APIs. We want this, we want this, but then what's the program? Where's the data coming from? It, it, can it be used across segments? Can it be used globally? Um, and then how we can then align with that, um, especially when you're talking about different cost structures, different capacity um, from a global versus a local perspective. And did we lose Paul? Because I can't see him now. <laughs> um, we have lost Paul, but um, um, I, uh, I assume that he's going to be joining us again. It, it looked like he was. Sometimes people need to, I don't know, come out, come back in again. Um, if they've just got some, I don't know, local bandwidth issues or something. Um, so Brent, I'm interested from from the business side, of it, and we've got some Alex Mifsud uh, joined us and uh, put a comment in the in the um, uh, in the online chat. Um, from a Weaver, where he's working, and they're about to launch um, uh, an API first bank account um, from their their business, and they're interested in, in in developer marketing. You were talking, Brent, about um, putting across to the business community uh, the power of uh, you know of, of, of APIs of, of an API first kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. How do you find some of the conversation with people to be starting to think about? You know, developers as customers, I and mean, this is just such a, um, a, a different headspace for it, people. Um, it actually is. Um, when you talk to different business areas, the mindset is, um, you know, how do we market this to other salespeople, right? How do we get other people interested? Um, comments like, well, a, de a developer would never go to a bank's website to see what APIs they have, you know, or what technology they have or technology they use. And I said, well, that's probably thinking, you know. 10, 20 years ago, um, in, in other roles I've had before joining Credit Suisse, we were very much approaching it from an API point of view and what we could do. And obviously you wanna see what the competitors are doing. And from that, <clears throat> my developers were looking into that aspect of, we wanna be, we wanna learn about new technology. We wanna learn about the new tech stack. What are others doing and how can we take advantage of learning things like that to implement it for ourselves so then we can be more competitive into the market. So from a business point of view, it's still that whole marketing and campaigning of generating revenue, but not understanding that the developer themselves are the ones who are gonna actually do the work to connect. And if you're not necessarily marketing it, but you're providing them with a tool to be able to then find a catalog, find what APIs are available, contribute to what potential APIs could be then um, discovered or prioritized within your own banking environment and and how that commu communication um, is evolving, you know, whether you're providing blogs or, or a different community um, aspect, making that available to get that kind of feedback. So what we've been doing is talking to a lot of fintech firms here in Switzerland um, to get their feedback in terms of what they potentially would like to see. And from there, um, also then using our own internal developers who have more of a external outlook to see what their feedback is as well in terms of developer portal from an internal context and what they would like to see also provided externally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Oh, Paul's I, back. I, I, I promise I wasn't at lunch. I, I, I was trying to get, <laughs> I was trying to get properly connected. 
<laughs> I was just sending out an SOS to the uh, to the back room. I, I, I but, hope um, that doesn't come out of my wages. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's actually a great, great time. So Brent was giving us some perspectives on uh, um, uh, a context, um, which is actually we've got an online chat here going with, with Alex as well. But um, uh, uh, Brad, I'd be interested in terms of this, um, uh, your approach about helping your business colleagues get getting in a, in a more mature organisation, getting their heads around um, developers as customers. Um, uh, externally, what you know, how, how you've been able to take people along on that journey, um, as well as the complementary thing about obviously selling benefits internally. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really hard to come at it directly. Um, I, I know Brent, you you you, uh, you touched on this a little bit too. If you come directly, you know, to your business and say, hey, you got to think about developers as your new your customers, right? Uh, it, it kind of falls on deaf, deaf ears, but what we found is early on we had some really good success stories. So, we started. We partnered uh, with Google uh, to open where people could. Uh, quote, you know, using like comparative raters and, you know, then bind through through nationwide. And it was really interesting that that was a really short, uh, you know, time from inception to delivery. And we started looking at that channel. So if you think about APIs being a new distribution channel for your product, so regardless of what industry you're in, in our case, you know, the protection industry, what they found is in the first couple months there, there was a 60% increase in conversion rate for folks who came through that API than alternative, even other digital channels like the, the website or the mobile app or something like that. And, and so I think that's how you have to come at it, right? You have to go to your business with things that they're used to, like business cases saying, hey, I don't think anybody would argue that, hey, if, if, what if I could get you a 60% increase it's done, right? They they want to they they want that sixty percent. They want that performance. While it was easy to come to the business with other industries and say, "Hey, look at what this company's done or that company's done," it would be really hard for them to think like, "Yeah, but that's them. This is us. We're in a different industry. People don't do this." When we made it real for our company and got one success story, people really started to take notice and thinking. Well, how can we do that? I mean, that seems really important. Um, what do we need to do? And then on top of that, um, up until that point, it was very bottoms up, meaning grassroots. It's the technology people trying to push new technology. It's hard for the business people to understand why that's important. When we had uh, good support from our leadership, all top saying, no, 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 this is the new, you know, Nationwide's been around for over 100 years. This is how we stay around for the next hundred years. We don't want to be the next um, blockbuster, for example, right? I mean, nobody goes and, and rents, <laughs> rents movies from blockbusters anymore. Is that that traditional business model of, in our case, meeting with an agent, sitting down, figuring out your protection? People are moving away from that. In many cases, they already have. And so, how do you meet members where they are? You need to do it digitally and on uh, adjacent platforms. And as soon as we started connecting those dots, people really you know, sat up and took notice. And I think that's what helped drive us to where we are now, where our big focus is on partnerships. It's not even like, hey, here's our API journey. It's, this is our partnership journey. This is how we're gonna go and successful. And the way that we happen to do that is by highly leveraging um, secure APIs. Now that's a, and and actually probably a great segue um, with the secure <laughs> overlay um, to another of Alex's point about um, uh, um, how to um, uh, build out risk and compliance oversight and all of those other things that um, you know respected organisations and trusted organisations know how to do because they've had to do it for for many many years um, and it's part of what what is built into the kind of ex, you know the, the de facto expectations of customer base. Um, but is often seen as as ways to actually slow down getting change through, and uh, and, and often there are tensions about the types of personality types that uh, um, and the ways of working in those areas. I don't know, Brent, has this been something that uh, 
Um, you know, how have you gone about doing uh, facing into that at, at Credit Suisse? Does well, it... especially being here in Switzerland and anything around client data um, is still securely protected. And with that, you know, and reviewing anything from an external API or connectivity point of view, there's, let's say, a difference if we're providing a client their own information via an API versus a third party um, and giving client data to a third party that the client has given permission to. Um, with that, it's about understanding because we're market driven not psd2 driven it is not necessarily that um, we have had some vetting process by the regulators or that that third party providers are licensed in a sense um, so we actually have to do our due diligence as well to ensure that this third party that the client has a relationship is with um, is one that we also then want to have a relationship with as a bank in order to ensure that the client is not taken advantage of in one way, shape or form. Um, even if it's information only and not necessarily payment processing going back and forth, um, you're still giving up data that can in some way be manipulated by a third party uh, and the client may not be aware. So for us, that is a key thing to understand is not, not only the OAuth 2 level, of um, security that we would have and, and SEA, but then as well as a bank, our responsibility for our clients to ensure that our clients are well taken care of. So, can, can, can I ask on that point in terms of, did you find much resistance or have to do extra evangelism around branding and brand strategy? Because I don't know if it's different between a bank or an insurance company, but, but Brad called out a fantastic story where they had a 60% uplift in a particular line of business, and it helped everyone understand the value of APIs. But but I've even had conversations, probably more so with banks than insurance companies, where the idea of, of privacy and security was so strong that even though the, the banker would accept that the younger, the younger customer expects brands to connect in a connected digital economy, that even then, it was somehow unnatural for a bank to be connecting to third parties that the bank should be in some way separate. So, so brand strat brands by their nature are emotional things. It's meant to be about the emotional connection between the customers and what you're doing. But obviously the staff get very emotionally connected to the brand as well. Did you find that Brent, can I ask you in terms of, was, was there a philosophical discussion about how API strategy and brand strategy work together? Um, not necessarily that we are at, at that level of discussion as yet, because for the most part, we're providing APIs for our clients to obtain most of their own data, right? So the, the externalization and, and integrating anything with third parties at this point, um, we only have one relationship in that regard. And let's say the adoption isn't there where we want it to be as yet. But I think it also comes down to the initiation of first online and mobile banking. How secure is it? Um, when you're looking at you know migrating from a, a password entry into an online and mobile piece um, into having a, a second level security level or, or layer, or in addition to that, um, IT came up with the best program in terms of security, but it also meant that it was not ease of use for the client. It was more cumbersome for the client. It was more protecting rather than offering a client experience that should have been there or we would have liked to have had there. Um, you know, if you want to create a secure vault that no one could get into, but it has all the information there, um, that's great. But if you want access to that information, then you need to have a, a bit more adaptable. And, and that's been from learning from the online, online mobile experience, there's a bit more of a there's a, a better understanding in terms of what the API process should be, what it should go through, and the securitization around that. Okay. I'd be curious about how um, how much in your experiences collectively you've you've seen the teams um, like security specialists actually also rethinking um, uh, their role in providing secure services that can be consumed and it, you know the same goes for infrastructure the same goes for like kind of all of the things in a way you know to, to, to be to be good and effective at APIs you've got to have all this other stuff that's scalable performance secure and everything behind it it's kind of like you've got to be good at tech yeah. generally um and, and you've also got to be good at all the all the, the business processes and enablement and cultures that allow you to collaborate that allow you to think differently um you know get really fast and agile uh, what, what, what are some of the things that you've seen and been doing to, to, to maybe try and provoke well, well, that? Well, I've definitely seen instances where security teams, certainly in, in one or two banks, have become major advocates of APIs. 
and I'm thinking of instances where um, when they when the idea first came to the forefront, it was like, oh, that sounds like a whole new attack surface and all this emotive language. And then when the the understanding grew that, OK, so we want to move away from issuing user access credentials to our customer staff who are then pushing payments or extracting data that's sensitive. And we have a whole industry around giving the humans authorization and segregation of duties and authentication and dual authorization to an automated process where one machine that we control instructs a machine that our supplier controls to do something in a highly parameterized fashion. So I think like when anything new comes along, probably the, the correct default setting for your for good risk managers is be skeptical because that's their job. Um, but definitely we've actually seen instances where pe uh, risk controllers, for the want of a better description, have quickly come up the learning curve and went, this is a much safer way of doing business uh, if it's properly controlled. Mm -hmm. And I mean, discoverability of APIs through portals are, you know, fantastic from an audit perspective or, um, you know, and this kind of embedded capability and visibility of documentation, you know, all sorts of, you know, the just just the kind of good disciplines that come along with being good at this. Well, well, well certainly, if you look what happened with Wirecard recently, I'm already starting to see banks start to open up APIs to assist with the audit process of companies. And it's it's vastly superior. Uh, in terms of getting the right data in place to establish if there's something funny going on. Mm. So, uh, yeah, right. uh, we've, we've, of course, needless to say, gone somewhat off the topic, but this is kind of, in a way, the joy of uh, of having a conversation as opposed to a, a structured structured presentation. Or we're kind of on topic, okay. but um, a little bit off uh, developer marketing per yeah. se. Um, uh, I, I could probably, um, yeah. Um, Brad, Brent and Brad, I, I hold the conversation there in relation to security people. Have, have you found them become advocates or are they still? Yeah. I mean, um, we, we, uh, I, I joke around and, and say that APIs are the paranoid technology of the world. Uh, and in, in many ways, I, I agree with you, Paul, like once, once people understand how APIs work, they'll, they realize that it, in many ways it's a lot more secure than even established technologies. I, I know for us, one of the old, more, I'll call it, you know, SOA related tech uh, ways that people interacted were, well, you'd have trusted applications, right? So as long as my traffic's coming from a trusted application, uh, we feel good about that. And it's something that our, our information risk management people um, we're used to and comfortable with and you know once we got them around and say no, 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 we don't we don't trust anybody anymore You know, it needs to be it needs to have a solid user context uh, We're not going to trust apps because that's actually not very secure and when they saw our mindset of, of where we were In some ways, it's like it's not about convincing the security people in your organization. It's about uh, Getting all the other people in your organization to think like security people Right, like they should have the same passion around this, and that's why you'd want to use APIs and have a good security mechanism. Um, and you know, it's interesting just to touch a little. I, I think Claire, what you were talking about before is like you have to just be good at technology. We spun up an entire enterprise uh, program when we first brought on Apogee to do APIs, just to focus on those foundational items. Like, how do we get really good at API security? How do we get really good at um, deployment processes and best practices and governance and making sure that we had a really solid foundation there before we went to what I would call more of the top of the pyramid of well now let's make sure that our products are really great and let's make sure we have the right API's I think it's way more important to focus on well get your foundation under you first and then all those other things like people, you know, the noise in the system is what I call it around. Well, is this secure? Is this going to be performance? Do we have the right stuff? That won't be noise to, to, to you know, hold up the progress that you want to make. No, I, I would concur with that, Brad, really um, because it is, it is about how you can can bring that in from a governance point of view and and bring about what you want to put in place and 
especially from an IT perspective, the developers are already using it on their on internally on our side. You know, you have a community already built up in terms of internally in terms of its use, the use cases around it, and then how you then bring that into place and and have the right enterprise architecture involved, having the right security teams involved. And therefore, once we get everyone becomes more comfortable and more proficient with that, and there is, let's say, at least on my side, looking at it from a global perspective, not just within my division, but on a global perspective in terms of the next steps and next stages that we're all aligning towards, um, then we're kind of already doing the pre-work on the business side or the senior side, the C-suite, um, to kind of be a bit more understanding in terms of what's already been done and why, um, to then have a more top-down approach in terms of establishing that as an API first mandate in order to then build off of the ecosystem, the architecture that has been put in place. Yeah. That's um, uh, so true, Brent, in terms of um, uh, how people are trying to balance off, uh, you and Brad, by talking about this trade-off between how much do you try and build ahead of uh, where there may be a, a kind of requirement versus what's a really clear customer need or so. I think Alex has brought that question up in the online chat about, Hey, but what about the customers? You know, it, 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 uh, can they be in, be duped by third yeah. party developers with third party IT, which is seen to be mediating on their behalf? That, it's, that, it's that, that's a great question. You know, do APIs make it easier to hack the humans rather than hack the machines? Uh, and and it's funny because uh, banks, particularly, uh, used to have branch networks, and there was this lots of standardization about what was offered in branches, but the job of the branch team was to localize to a certain degree and personalize to a degree what the bank was doing in that suburb or in that town in the pre-digital era. And, and every six months or at random intervals, there'd be a knock on the door and somebody would be there from head office to go through the books to make sure that the customer experience, given the distribution of decisions into the branch, to make sure that the the loan the loan approvals were correct, that the pricing was correct, there was no, uh, and you know from time to time a branch manager got fired because, you know they weren't an effective intermediary or the mediation they're providing at the edge of a network, wasn't appropriate, so back then the banks had a good degree of preventative controls. Here's the manual. Here's how you're to run your branch, and detective controls, surprise visits to see what was going on. And then the banks in particular, uh, like many social organizations, went into one app and there was a huge amount of preventative control. Nothing could get on our branded app until about 27 people signed off on it because it was going to be there and the whole population were going to be using it. Now that we're moving towards this mediation layer of third parties, there will need to be the balance of both preventative controls and detective controls on the basis that Innovation and business development is moving again to the edge of your network. Uh, and, and there's localization and personalization happening at the edge of your network uh, by somebody who has been given scope to, to assist you in that process. So it's got, it, it'd be a case of all the good stuff that needs to happen around API documentation and API monitoring, but then also walking in the customer's shoes, use your API analytics to see where is the traffic coming from who's making the API calls and go on those customer journeys, just like the traditional financial brands used to knock on the door of their offices and their branches to see, was the localization appropriate? It's gonna be the exact same balance of preventative and detective controls. Um, but just like branches gave scale and the ability to customers start their journeys where it was convenient for them, it's going to be the exact same benefits uh, from open innovation business models. But but having said that, Paul, I mean, I still see research and surveys where um, clients still prefer that their main bank um, would be able to provide them more self-service capabilities or more digital banking capabilities, um, or even some of the what the third-party providers might offer in addition to what banking products can complement, uh, and and therefore. It is, yes, they can be duped and some have been duped and it, that will be continuing. Continuing, yeah. But I think that is where by having the right marketplace, by having the right, to, let's say, developer portal, we can actually then look at the partnerships of trying to bring some non-banking products into our environments or like insurance yeah. um, and, and vice versa um, to then complement the client experience of who they already trust. 
without having to worry about them building trust with someone else and that 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 that, that fails right so yeah. I, I i as a mature big bank would like to retain my clients i would like to offer them more products for my clients and and apis and open banking offers that by looking at other marketplaces what like um nationwide, et cetera. Um, and then if nationwide or an insurer would feel like they want to partner up with Credit Suisse, they can go to ours when, we, when, we've, when we've put it on in place and then say, ah, we would like to have this product suite as a part of our offering as well. And then how you then can come together on that. And, and trust, of course, being uh, uh, such a hard to, <laughs> you know, such an emotional response, you know, sentiment. We kind of, you know, like we say, it's hard to burn, it's easy to lose. Correct, especially um, in today's environment um, where, um, let's say, big organizations aren't as trusted as they used to be in the past. Uh, I think that is also a driver of why um, certain, let's say, individuals would want to go to a startup or or a fintech firm like a revolut or something like that because they ah they're small i'm going to be someone who they care about and as they grow i can grow with them right yeah, great we've got um another great question from alex might, might perhaps invite brad to um to answer this one from a marketing perspective is there a choice between a, a walled garden you know selected developers only or um open access to, to clients and their developers. Um, have you have you had that discussion um, at National Mutual, for example? Yeah, yeah, actually, that's, I think that actually dovetails really good in just to the discussion we were just having that, that Brent was talking through is uh, a nationwide anyway, we've, we've really gone all in on partnerships. And, you know, I think it's um, just my opinion, I think it's a mistake to focus on any one audience only, right? Because if for, from a, from, for us, it's a, it's a B2B, you know, typically your, your frontline consumers aren't the ones that are consuming your APIs. It's, it's other adjacent companies or industries that you're trying to be innovative with, you know, on those, those edges. And those companies are just like ours. There's people that are executives, there's people that are developers, there's marketing people, there's the whole gambit. So realistically, I think what you need to look at it is, Just lost Brad there. Sorry, Brad. We just um, uh, would you kindly just while you're finished speaking, perhaps switch off the video, and if we just hear the audio yeah, for your work. response, um, it's a shame not to be able to see you as well. But uh, go for it. Yeah. Just missed that. One. Yeah. So uh, hopefully this this helps. Um, so we we've we've you know kind of positioned ourselves to have this partnership portal that articulates our, our solutions and no nope, that didn't work maybe we'll um all right like at the top of the funnel you can speak plain language at anyone tech we might need no? to bring you back actually it doesn't seem to be a, a video thing a bandwidth thing it just seems to be some glitches all right can, can you hear me now or is it still gone we hear you in blocks. I'll, I'll drop and come back. Okay, thank you, Brad. Um, so um, David Cunning has just asked an interesting question. Maybe um, uh, for either, um, perhaps Brent could take this one. Is it not the case that permissions and openness is based on the business model that benefits the banks rather than the third party? And is there any bank that is allowing innovation to flourish without a clear view of the revenue coming to them? Another classic, do you build it and they will come? Or... Uh, do you try and build a business case around something that perhaps people don't understand yet or haven't quite got their heads around? Well, like, this is a, a subject very close to my heart because I think everybody understands cloud because it saves money, <laughs> and so they sign up for that. Well, um, and you, know, you ask them to invest in APIs, and it's a much more complex question. Well, I, I, and cloud is still, uh, although it seems simplistic to actually evolve and, and migrate to the cloud versus what you have for standard hardware is a different story as well. Um, but it is an easier case to explain. Um, for, let's see, the openness is based on the business model that benefits the banks rather than the third party. Well, again, it goes back down to partnerships. Um, nothing is for free, you know, but if a client wants to do business with that third party and thereby is requesting permission, 
and authorizing that third party to do stuff on their behalf, um, then naturally with open banking APIs and the connectivity, um, that is what is in the nature to be done. Um, if you look at Switzerland being market driven, there really isn't as much of that to date where banks are being requested to give a lot of client information over. If you look at under PSD2 and the guidelines have been there in terms of um, accounts and payments, yes, next generation of what will come after that. Open Banking UK has actually gone beyond PSD2, which is really great. And that is as well, in my view, the market driven side of the regulation. Australia is doing likewise in terms of having a regulated environment, but open data, if you will, rather than just open banking, because you're also looking at the integration and touch points for utilities and others that is not necessarily yeah. banking specific or finance specific. And, and that is where if you put more information in the control of the clients or the customers, um, they will then tend to drive the market of where it will go to next. And that is where as a bank or as an insurer or as a utility, um, you need to ensure that you have the ecosystem in place to be able to do so. And yes, there are some models that the bank will consider, well, how can we monetize this or the insurer or whoever's holding the data, how can we monetize this? But in the end, your APIs become a commodity in a sense, and the margins of any potential money-making opportunities is going to dwindle over time. So if you're the first in the market to do certain options like that, you probably could make a bit of money up front, but over time, the margins will continue to decrease. And so it's about being, do you want to be first in the market to have an offering? Do you want to be fast follower or you'll catch up and do PSD2 because it's regulated, not because you want to do it in the mindset of the ecosystem of really offering open banking or open finance or open data. I, I, I think that's a really great question. Uh, and what I think is happening slowly but surely is that is that bankers are you know incumbent bankers are starting to realize that this is not a zero sum game um that 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 the nature of digital ecosystems is that in collaboration with partners you can reach micro segments of the market and do business that wouldn't be economic for either so, so that you're these are little little joint ventures that can take place at the level of the customer journey. And they are creating new opportunities and they're creating new transactions. So we've seen instances of, of you know, car dealers at car auctions getting, car, getting loans, supplemental loans from their bankers through a third party digital interface to buy cars for their stock at that auction where they have to pay for the cars at the end of the auction. And it's happening through a third party interface. We're seeing payday loans being introduced into the work scheduling apps of agency workers where their, their, their employer is a corporate customer of a bank that's put an instant payment API and an instant credit API into their work scheduling app. So we're seeing loans being done on micro segments where it wouldn't have been economic or practical to do through the mainstream digital channel of the bank. And it's creating new demand because the credit opportunity is introduced at the third party digital surface. And so therefore it's definitely not a zero sum game. So that understanding has to grow across the incumbent banks that, that platform ecosystems expand markets and, and it allows companies to collaborate together in a highly efficient manner. And if, if the initiative fails, it fails in a highly economic manner because the API products are reusable for the next partner and the next opportunity. So in that context, in terms of David Cunningham's question, are there banks starting to let innovation flourish without a clear view of the revenue involved? Yes, I think so. I think they get the theory and now it's a matter of scaling up this activity in a controlled fashion because they're bankers. But, but they definitely do want this, um, this emerging innovation that can drive new revenues to appear and, and they know they don't need to know precisely what that innovation is going to be in advance they get the theory but they're naturally conservative and, and they should be because they're banks and there's people's money involved one of the conversations that has been going through a few of the other talks um over these last uh, couple of days has been about the the choices the trade-offs that organizations mature organizations make between building a business within a business or a, um, uh, and or partnering with a business and or changing the business 
top to bottom because of all of the dramatic different ways in which one needs to think about innovation, change the culture behavior, overhaul the, the technology top to bottom. Um, I'd be interested from from Brent and Brad's perspective, um, you know, uh, what you can what you can share from your observations of 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 you know being within large organisations, how how you how that's how you're having those trade off conversations and how they're playing out. Well, I think from a from an innovation point of view, you have different levels of innovative ideas coming from the bottom up depending on people's backgrounds and what they're interested in learning. So being a bit more proactive, let's say, than just a normal daily business routine, whether you're a requirements engineer, a developer, or even a product owner from an agile point of view. Um, not everything has to come from the top down in terms of ideation and ideas of what could be other opportunities for the organization, um, whether you're a bank or an insurer or, or, or some other large entity. Um, and from that, uh, the creativity that we've seen, at least within Credit Suisse, and the different proposals that have been coming forth, we, we run some, uh, we've actually have promoted internally these sessions where people can present their ideas to senior management um, between business and IT, and in order to then say, this is what we're thinking of. We don't care about the tech stack as of yet, but this is what we're thinking of in terms of new opportunities, um, either from an internal perspective or internal external perspective or purely external from a product mindset point of view of different offerings and and how that innovation can be a driver. Now you are also look at, at least from a divisional aspect, there are different areas within um, COO areas or CTO areas where there's innovation from an IT point of view or there might be um, innovation from a strategy point of view on the business side and, and how that can come together. And then obviously there's the overarching strategy and where innovation comes into that. So you could also then talk about should it be centralized, decentralized? For the most part, it is decentralized from a bottom up approach. I, I think without having a clear strategy in terms of where you want to go, it's a lot harder to have that from a top down view if it's not part of your strategy, irregardless if it's centralized or decentralized too. So. Oh, thank you. Um, Brad, I don't know how you're going with the uh, with the tech there. Yeah, I, but, hopefully, um, you guys, hopefully you guys can hear me. Uh, any comments would be great. We're, we're actually only, also only have a couple of minutes left, if you can believe it. Um, time flies. <laughs> um, so, Brad, if you can join us and perhaps, you know, maybe even yeah, kind of sum look. up, uh, given this is a big, big end topic to finish up with, it would be great to um, get a chance to say um, uh, <laughs> goodbye. Yeah, it sounds like maybe you guys maybe, can't, maybe can't, can't hear me. Can't follow up. Paul. Um... Claire, Claire, thanks a million. Now, now you know what it's like to read the news and the clips don't come on. Yeah. When, when you're the news reader. <laughs> oh, uh, here he is. Yeah, we can hear yeah, you now. I, I, I'm can here. You can you, can you hear me? Oh. It's, it sounds like me. OK. Yeah. All right. Well, all right. Apparently, I have to have my my uh, camera on. Yeah, I I was uh, yeah I was going to uh, to basically echo the sentiment that Brent Brent was saying. We we in we have federated the development of AI and digital products, but we've we've top down centralized the the business of of I would say business of driving innovation or making sure that we have a cohesive digital strategy on how to digitize our our traditional products, and so. Um, I, I don't think it's one or the other. I, I think you need to have a centralized area that can help uh, drive all the other businesses in your in a large organization like ours. Oh, I think we lost you again. I'm afraid, Brad. <laughs> we need to move this onto Google Cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I think uh, we'll uh, yep, put you under the API days, guys. Uh, whoops. Um, uh, if that wasn't already um, farewell to Brad, hopefully we can say goodbye to him properly. Um, uh, Paul, would you like to just uh, close out for us before we uh, um, finish off yeah, this session? Yeah, well, firstly, huge thanks and appreciation to, to Brad and Brent uh, for sharing their experience. There's no substitute for, for practitioner experience. Um, and congratulations to them both in terms of what they're doing because it's pioneering work 
Uh, and there's yes, nothing more challenging and rewarding than pioneering work. So admiration and kudos to them. Um, uh, and in terms of, uh, if I could sum up, like anything else in terms of the waves of innovation and development, the, the, these are human challenges. Um, and to the, the diffusion of innovation uh, is a classic curve where there's early adopters and early opinion leaders, uh, and then it hits a tipping point. So we all know we haven't hit the tipping point yet in terms of the API economy, but but when it does and it will, it, it's going to be absolutely huge. Um, but it'll never be as much fun as it was during the pioneering phase. Um, so in that context, um, thanks to them uh, and thanks to our guests. Um, and we hope we added some value today. Uh, and if people have been frustrated because we had some technology snafus, please reach out through the the partners village or reach out through the chat uh, and if there's any unanswered questions we can we'll be sure to get to them and thank you to you claire you you you've earned your lunch today <laughs> oh not at all thank you all um for the for putting in your time because uh, uh this is all um giving back to the community yep. the api community as a whole yeah. and uh, um it's fantastic to to have them and i know that they'll have appreciated your time so thank you very much Thanks. and uh have a great rest of your day and the uh, rest of the conference. Um, and, uh, yep, I'm sure anybody's contactable via LinkedIn and all of the usual yeah. channels. So. so thank you very much. Be thank well you. and stay Take healthy. Care. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. Thanks, Brad. Thanks. Bye. 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 Get it. Thank you very much. Bye. See ya. Thank you. Yeah.